Eh, I'm Jose Angel Mateo, eh, um, Mara, Nico, you and me today. We are all part of the digital finance team where we advise CFOs on the digital transformation journey. And today we are going to talk about the uh, main challenges uh, for CFO. The first thing we want to, uh, to say about sustainability is that sustainability is a must in the market, not because of uh, the regulator or because it's mandatory or not, it's, it's a must because of the stakeholders. All the stakeholders are asking uh, for ESG um, for ESG project for uh, ESG responsible company. And as you can see here, we have uh, some interesting ratios. For example, uh, regarding your investors, uh, all the investor banks, they have their own uh, green targets regarding uh, the investment portfolio. So it's going to be easier for the company to get access to financing in the market if they are, if the company is considered a, a green company or, you, or if you are talking about a green project. Also, you are going to be able to get a cheaper or better interest rate conditions because nowadays in the market, the, the offer is uh, lower than the demand uh, regarding green projects. Also, if we move to the consumer or the clients, as you can see here, almost 50% of the consumer are uh, willing to pay a premium if the product is branded uh, as a ESG responsible. And the, the, um, the main thing to, to highlight here is that this ratio is higher uh, also in young people. Okay. Also, we, if we talk about talent. Uh, this ratio go higher to 65% of the people that are more likely to work for a company with, with a sustainable uh, sustainability credibility. So this is going to be key to attract talent in the market. And also, if we talk about our competitors in the market, as you can see here, 96% of the uh, biggest companies in the world, they already uh, are reporting an ESG reporting. And I think this rate here is from 2020. I think it, uh, nowadays it should be uh, 100%. Um, so uh, as, as I say, this is a mass in the market because of, of your stakeholders. As you can see here, when we talk about sustainability, we have identified three phases. You want to have an action plan. Of course, you must know your information. You must have a report. And in, in order to have a report, you must know your data. You, you have to be able to, to have your data. So we have summarized here all the challenges of the company regarding sustainability. And we have highlighted uh, the areas that finance should be involved and also the areas that finance should, uh, should lead. And I think that uh, finance should lead two areas. Uh, one of them is reporting, and the other one is the ESG capex analysis. But first of all, uh, we are going to talk about all the three phases. Uh, regarding the data, the sustainability data uh, are not currently in, this, in the system of the company is data that you have to identify and measure. For example, if you are talking about energy consumption or you are talking about fuel consumption or CO2 emissions, you have to identify this impact, you have to measure this, these impacts, and then you had to collect and record the data in your system because it was not previously in your system. And then, of course, this data uh, has to be audited by a third party. So that's why finance should, uh, has to be involved in the audit and quality check because of the broad experience that finance has in the uniqueness and, and quality of the data. Then talking about reporting, this is uh, one area that, that we are going to talk later. But in reporting, you have two dimensions. One of the dimensions is the external dimension, the information that you disclose or you report to the market uh, or the rating agency, for example. And nowadays, all the companies are working on this uh, on this topic. Uh, but also, when you talk about reporting, you have also an internal uh, vision, the analytical reporting. Uh, for example, uh, we all know that when you talk about, about financial or economics, you have your analytical reporting, your uh, economic analytical reporting. And now you must have also your ESG analytical reporting in order, for example, your geography, your business areas, whatever, in order to be able to make decisions and to align your operation with your strategy. And of course, also this, uh, this analytical uh, reporting uh, can have uh, an 
it, it could be with more frequency than the, than the market reporting. And nowadays, the company are starting to work on, in this ESG and anti-car reporting, okay? And then if we move to the action plan, we have, of course, the strategy and roadmap. No, sorry. If, you, if, if we go to the strategy and roadmap, of course, finance must be involved here because the controlling area has a cross vision of, of all the areas of the company. Then, uh, of course, the business area has to identify an, uh, the optimization initiatives. Also, it's key the supply chain transformation because, uh, as you know, the company is is going to be also responsible of the of the ESG impact of the providers, and the finance department must be involved also here through the purchasing department to ensure the ESG impact of, of the providers. And then, of course, we have also the ESG capex analysis and funding. This is key because the the capex of today is going to define the the company that you are going to be in the future. And nowadays, the company has both economical targets, economical targets and ESG targets. So when you make the decision about CAPES, you have to incorporate your ESG impact in your CAPEX analysis. And this is something new for the companies. Um, and we think that this is the next step for the companies to work on this uh, CAPEX analysis, incorporating the ESG impacts. And then, of course, we have the sustainability training and talent. You have to incorporate your uh, sustainability knowledge and skills um, to be able to drive this uh, ESG journey. Okay, and now we are going to talk in, in more detail, in deeper detail about the ESG reporting and the, about the ESG CAPEX analysis. So, Mark, you uh, can go on with the ESG reporting detail. Yes. Thank you, Jose. Okay, so um, the sustainability reporting, we're going to do it. We're going to uh, give you a context with the challenges, and then we're going to do an approach and how we're going to tackle those challenges, and then we're going to do the methodology. Um, okay, so first of all, um, ESG reporting is becoming a need for all organizations, uh, if we, as we've already said, due to the increasing awareness of sustainability, like climate change, gender gap, etc. But it's not that easy and straightforward for organizations to implement it. And it's also not easy for stakeholders to understand it. Because as of right now, the information is not comparable or standardized. Um, so we have identified these issues that we'll mostly tackle along this part of the presentation that challenge the reporting of sustainability information. So we have uh, the first ones are the market factors or external factor factors, and we have seen that due to the existence of many reporting frameworks and standards, which are not homogenized, selecting one framework to report or reporting with more than one is a hard task as they don't map against each other and the information to report <coughs> is quite different. The scopes are different as well. We have some international or European. And therefore, this also takes up more time and money and can lead to uh, compromising the company's integrity, transparency and trust of those reports of their sustainability activities. So additionally to that, um, more stakeholders are interested in the sustainability um, that the companies are doing. So their, their sustainability strategy, their objectives and what they are actually doing and achieving in terms of sustainability. So in conclusion, we have, um, they want to, they want accountability from these businesses. And these reports, they need to reflect this. And this, relate, this relates to the following one, which is the increasing of the market expectations uh, about sustainability action. But it's important that while attending to these higher market expectations, um, companies avoid greenwashing. And greenwashing, it's basically just telling the, um, your consumers, your stakeholders, that you're doing more, sustainably speaking, than what, you're, than what you are actually doing. Because greenwashing can lead to disastrous brand image and have hefty monetary fines. Um, in terms of greenwashing, there's this example that uh, they were they published today that HSBC, the bank, they 
two of their art birds were were banned because they were saying that they were planting a lot of <clears throat> a lot of trees to offset their CO2 emissions and help their clients become net zero. But they were actually trying to hide or cover with sustainability. But um, that they are the 13th uh, funders of fossil fuel um, companies and projects. And now for the internal part, we have the uh, sustainability reporting is not conducted or kept updated periodically. And it is still a very manual process, so there's not automation in place. In most companies, including us for now, we use Excel to compile all this information and to generate these reports, so internally and externally, as Jose Angel said, on these ESG factors. And this may give way, as with financial reporting, to question the quality and traceability of the data and other um, issues with data. And then lastly, um, the reporting should help sustainability decision making at different levels, as we've said. And this also requires for increased expertise of um, those data owners and uh, decision makers, etc. And now onto the um, approach that we are developing in order to, to tackle those, uh, those challenges. Uh, this approach is based on these five pillars, and the first one is that reporting is based on the market standards, so they can be comparable and avoid greenwashing and be understood by the stakeholders. The second one is that ESG has to be integrated in the external reporting, so in the non-financial report and in the internal analytical reports, which are required at different levels of the organization. And while the external part has advanced quite a lot, analytical reporting is still not as mature. And then we have the selection of the tool in order to automate this whole reporting process. And on the fourth pillar, we have the selection of the ESG KPIs. And for this, we are developing an asset in order to help the clients efficiently choose those KPIs that are relevant to their business based on a sector benchmark. And then the last one is the action plan and roadmap. And in this part is to continue with the next steps of the sustainability wheel that Jose Angel just showed. And the ESG CAPEX will be presented later. And now onto the standards and scorings. So first mentioned that the three in blue are the standards and these dictate how and what sustainability information should be reported. And then on the yellow part, we have the ratings slash scores. And these tell you how sustainable the company's activities are. So, and ultimately categorizes your company as sustainable or not. And then, so in terms of standards with which to report, currently there are many standards and frameworks in the market, as we've said, but a few organizations are carrying out these homogenizing exercise in order to standardize them and to homogenize the information that has to be reported. So we have the Global Reporting Initiative, we have the International Sustainability Standards Board and the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group. Um, just to mention that while these three are going to homogenize the reporting, um, for now the International Sustainability Standards Board is basically absorbing um, these other standards in the market like SASB and the IIRC. And since the last year, the ISSB and the EFRAC are going to be published around now, October, November. Um, we have been mainly focusing on fully understanding and developing everything around the Global Reporting Initiative. Now, in this table, we have a comparison of the main characteristics of these standards and two of the main scores. And overall, it's quite self-explanatory. So we have the um, what they report, what they entail in reporting. So ESG, so environmental, social and governance, their maturity. So the first one um, has been around since 1997 and the other two are going to be published um, around this time. And then scope, we have the Global Reporting Initiative and the IWSB are going to be international, but the EFRAG is going to be um, targeted towards European com um, companies and those that have operations in Europe. 
And then um, something to note is that materiality, when we talk about materiality in this sustainability scope, it's basically um, to distinguish who the reporting is for. So we have reporting on one side, the reporting of the consequences of the company's ESG factors on the world, so on society, on climate, on the environment in general. And then um, we have how the world's ESG factors can or will impact the company. So how climate change is going to affect the company in the short, medium and long term. So on this date, we have the, the Global Reporting Initiative and the IWSB are both single materiality, but they are opposed to each other. So in order to live in this world together, the Global Reporting Initiative is going to request companies to report how like what they are doing for the world and on the other side it's the how the world is going to affect the company that is going to be required but by, by the international sustainability standards board and the effort is double materiality so it's going to require both and then on the yellow side we have the ratings and the scores and these two are two of the most important and but there are also many more like the certified big corporation here at the bottom and the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and Equibodies, etc. And just to say that the EU taxonomy indicates um, the percentage of the company's um, economic operations considered to be sustainable. So this scoring is focused just on the environmental part of the ESG with six main objectives and two of these are climate based and have already been published and many companies are already reporting it but the other four are going to be published in this coming january this next year and then on the other side we have the carbon disclosure project um, which is also only focused on environment as well but it gives a letter-based rating to how the company is managing the risks and opportunities derived from these um, environmental aspects now, um, this framework guides the implementation of the analytical side of reporting. So a few things to mention from this framework is that the analytical axis just here at the top in the middle, they represent the levels or dimensions that the organizations need to report at. So for example, as Jose Anke said, and, um, they need to report by geography or by business unit, um, etc. So entity data generates more than 50 reports internally and when they report uh, greenhouse gas emissions they need to do it at EMEA level and business unit and by geography etc. So also the periodicity of these reports it's not annually anymore and they can be by semester or monthly and it's in this bit that the companies are still quite behind so the analytical access. And also just to clarify on the scopes definition, here at the top we have in the environment inputs, um, you can see that there's three scopes and these relate to greenhouse gas emissions. So we have that the first one are those emissions uh, from sources that are owned and controlled by the organization, such as from fuel, source, uh, from fuel consumption for heating. Um, scope two are the energy and direct emission and those that result from the generation of purchased or acquired electricity, heating, cooling and steam, and they're consumed by the organization. So it's not, so it's consumed by the organization, but not generated within the company. And then scope three, the last one is that those indirect emissions that are not in scope two, and they occur outside of the organization. So this one, this one includes um, upstream and downstream emissions. And for example, they are the like third party transportation or traveling by employees when we go to another office in another city and the trains we take and the taxis, etc. And now on the reporting tool. So in order to um, automate this reporting process, we have conducted an analysis of some of the tools on the market. And these tools, some of them already have a reporting, a sustainability reporting module or some other like Oracle and SAP or some others 
are designed um, to report ESG as ESG AO. Overall, this selection will be dependent on the company's requirements as they all of these tools uh, present different characteristics and scopes, standards, etc., which we'll take into account when advising on the reporting tool to choose. The first two though, um, Oracle and SAP, it's, it, they make more sense to implement if the company has already, they, um, the company already has them in place since it's easier to integrate them. And then these, um, this is the asset, the KPIs benchmark asset that, um, that I told you in the fourth pillar. And this asset that we are developing, it benchmarks the ESG KPIs that different companies are reporting and that we have categorized by sector. And to note, these KPIs are based on the Global Reporting Initiative standard, the one I previously mentioned. This way, we can help companies select the ones that apply to, to their own organization based on their sectors, and they, we, they can do it more efficiently, easier. And so on the first sprint, we can see it's a hospitality company, and some of the KPIs you can see there from the social, um, social part of the ESG. And in this case, for example, it would be interesting for, for competitors, well, not for competitors, for their own uh, company, to know that competitors are reporting for like their GA, their greenhouse emissions, um, they're reporting it by room. So they also reporting their water consumption and waste generation by room. And in this other print, we have a pharmaceutical company and it would be interesting for them and advantages for a pharmaceutical company to know that the competitors are reporting their global and um, their greenhouse gas emissions by division or department. And then on for all of these, we have we already have a couple of references. Um, on this first one, we this first one has been carried out by the Salesforce team. And it's about measuring and management of the building's emission of these uh, BBVA. So measuring and management of the scope one with the implementation of Salesforce Net Zero Cloud. And this additionally can help them track the ESG objectives. And then on this last one, we have the Asahi Kase, which is a Japanese chemist, and they are calculating the greenhouse gas emissions per product in scopes one, two, and the upstream part of three. But um, with the implementation of Anaplan and Tableau. So now Nico is going to talk about the green, the sustainability capex. So as as uh, Mark just mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability capex. We're going to talk uh, talk about the approach and the methodology we use to to tackle one of these projects. Um, as as Jose Angel mentioned at the beginning when he did the introduction, uh, the capex analysis is the, the, the best uh, tool that the company has to understand and know if the operations are going to be aligned with the with the strategy in general. So uh, being able to analyze to analyze the, the capex is is key is key to understand how the company is going to look in the future. So what we have in this slide it's a maturity model. So traditionally when we talk about capex we talk about the the financial cash flows uh, and, and, and the financial analysis of the different investment. Uh, when, when talking about investment, we always talk about return on investment, net present value, cash flow, inflow, outflows. But uh, lately, companies are not only analyzing uh, the, the capex and the investment from a financial point of view, but also from a non-financial point of view. And even though the non-financial point of view, the, there is there is some progress uh, uh, that has been made already, we, we propose uh, uh, to to add some some analysis to to this to this current analysis to make it more complete and and, and consider not only let's say the impacts of of the financial point of view and and within the, the the impacts of of the investment within the company but also outside of the company. So if we if we look at the first one as I just mentioned is the traditional economic cash flow, and then on the second one is the ESG impacts that affects the company. 
when we talk about the, the ESG, we can uh, we can analyze an ESG and investment. We can analyze it uh, both ways: how ESG impacts the company and how the company impacts the ESG. So I think the best way to understand this is to give some examples. Uh, on on the second one, when we analyze the ESG impacts that affect the company, we can say, for example, a company is a, um, a hotel that is in the mountain is is thinking on. A, uh, building a, a ski resort in the mountain. Uh, analyzing, for example, uh, the weather conditions is key to understand if there is going to be snow in the future or not. That's 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 an ESG that is impacting the company. And then at the same time, we can say, OK, uh, if, uh, within the same example, if we build this ski resort, uh, diversity, uh, if if we hire uh, women and, and against um, against uh, uh, men, uh, how how you tackle diversity when hiring people? So when when we are talking about the the, the second this this second step, it's important to say that some uh, things are going to be uh, easy to monetize, and you can you can even though you are analyzing ESG and the company, you can put value to that. Some of the impacts are not going to be easy to value them, but they're still important when analyzing the ESG. So that's how the ESG impacts the company. If we go to the number three, it's like how uh, the investment, how the company affects the society. So, for example, if we are building an office in a outside of, a, of a neighborhood in, in, in outside of the city, if we build a big office, that office is going to create jobs outside of the office. For example, there's going to be open restaurants, they're going to open a kiosk, they're going to open supermarkets. So that's the kind of impacts we analyze on the number three. So what we are proposing here is not only, it's, it's basically adding up all these analyses to make it a more complete and, and to have a bigger picture when making a decision about investing in one thing or, 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 in, a, or in another. And of course, in the end, if you have all this information, you can analyze and update your strategy and make sure you're tackling the goals that you propose uh, when, when you define those that ESG strategy. On the right side of, of the slide, what we see is basically is, uh, if you have one plus two, you have the aggregated financial statements. When you uh, when you um, add to the CAPEX analysis uh, the ESG impact, you can also uh, access to better funding. That means that if, you're, if your project is going to have some kind of impact uh, on the on the ESG, uh, banks and investors are going to give you better rates. The government can give you better tax rates, or or even you can go into the market and get uh, get get uh, money for, for for cheaper rates. So basically, it's, it's yeah, it's it's, it's it's you get better access. And then uh, in the end, when you have the ESG plus plus the the economic business case, you have. The aggregated financial and the no financial statements, as you see on the on the right side. Here's important to remark that everything when you're talking about a uh, capex, of course, you are talking about forecast. These are not actual numbers, nor there are no actual figures, but they are like forecast and projections. So basically, it's like here I just told you. If you want to summarize in in in, in one phrase, it's not only a, a not, not only consider the the financial, but also the ESG impacts both ways inside the company and outside the company. So here what we're saying is like, OK, let's let's take let's let's go through how would we do a, a project like this. At the beginning, you need when you are uh, uh, deciding an investment, you need to decide what kind of dimensions are, going, are you going to analyze from a, a ESG point of view. For example, if you're building a factory, you need to take, consider CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions is uh, then you, you need to decide how you measure those CO2 emissions. CO, CO2 emissions are measured in, in tons. And then if you move to the next one, you need to put value to it. I just wanted to remind you that you will not always be able to put value to all the impacts of the ESG. That's why in this case, we give an example we, where we can do, let's say, the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, methodology. But in some cases, you will uh, stop on the number two. For example, as I mentioned before, diversity. Uh, value diversity is, is kind of complicated. But if we continue with the example we have here, CO2, we have CO2 emissions in tons. Then we put some value on it. And then, of course, you need to uh, analyze the risk and dependencies impact. That means that, for example, if we create a factory that has a lot of CO2 emissions, then we will potentially face fines. So it's not only about 
uh, analyzing the impact, but also analyzing the, re the risk and dependencies of, uh, for example, as I mentioned before, if the weather is not good enough, how much how much snow are you going to get on the ski resort if you're planning to build a ski resort? Finally, you have the business case, and the business case is you will have a net present value as traditionally you, you will have when you do a cap and analysis, but you also will have the inner impacts that, as, as, I, as I said, number two, the impacts of the ESG in the company and also the outer inputs. If you build an office, for example, the jobs that you're going to create, uh, create outside of, of the office because you put an office in a, in a whatever neighborhood. And then finally, on the ESG in, strategy impact, if you are going to create a factory that is going to uh, reduce emissions significantly, then you can update your targets and say, look, OK, uh, our target was to be net zero emission by 2030. Now we can uh, be achieve that goal in, in 2028. So that, that's that's basically it. End to end, uh, you select the dimensions, you, you, you put numbers to it, you put value when possible, you analyze the risk and dependencies, and then you have a business case, but not traditional business case. It's a business case with more information, with more impacts within the company and outside the company. And late, lastly, you, you will be able to uh, steer your ESG strategy and make sure you are uh, achieving your goals and you, your goals are, are real and, and, and achievable. Climate change, social injustice and equal economic growth. Global issues that need to be addressed today. But how? By defining goals to guide the actions of governments and companies. Businesses taking them into account can both solve the ESG problems and also improve their reputation, revenues or streamline their operations. The CFO is in the optimal position to drive this sustainability transition. The challenges? First, to define and report a sustainability strategy which will be then pulled by the other three. 1. ESG Strategy and Reporting from entity data, we will assist with the ESG strategy definition and a sustainability action plan, designing a predictive analytical reporting to enrich ESG decision-making and align sustainability goals with the operations. Additionally, we are experts in regulatory reporting, so we will guarantee the compliance with the EU and the IFRS requirements, which are enabling comparable sustainability reporting. The EU has introduced a taxonomy for economic activities to achieve the six established environmental goals. The first two have been released, and the other four will be in January 2023. IFRS through the ISSB will guide the disclosing of sustainability reporting expected to be released by the end of 2022. 2. ESG Investment Analysis and Funding Selection We will improve the investment's comparability analysis through the monetization of the ESG impacts applying new green metrics such as the Sustainable Net Present Value. Moreover, we will help obtain the best sustainability funding by classifying the projects and activities based on their sustainability impact and presenting the required information to investors. 3. ESG Supply Chain Transformation With scopes of emissions 1 and 2, the company has a higher control than those of scope 3. Therefore, we will provide support to the CFO and the supply chain department to have an end-to-end -end sustainability vision and establish partnerships with the critical suppliers to enable these to become greener. 4. ESG Finance Operating Model The last challenge to a successfully transition is the need to integrate the sustainability mindset in the department's DNA and way of working. From entity data, we will help integrate the social goals in the finance workforce, manage the cultural change and upskill the team. Now, you know everything you need to embrace a sustainable future for you and your company. Let's walk this sustainability path together. <laughs>